Good morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, August 2nd, 2022, and this is a meeting of the Council Subcommittee on Water's Issues, and this meeting is now called to order. May I have roll call, please? Chairperson Rusing. Here. Member Montoya. Here. Member Sishka. Here. All are present. Thank you. We have a public comment section here. Is there anyone here that wishes to comment on something that's not on the agenda today? Okay, thank you. All right, moving on to item 4A, water service applications. We have water service application number WSA 22-017, submitted by Michael Taylor Architects, Inc., on behalf of property owner Healing Hands, LLC. And it's 2.01 acre parcel located at 1537 Distinction Way in Prescott, Arizona. And I just wanted to say that uh, how we usually do this is the staff gives a presentation and answers question. And then if the applicant is here, we'd appreciate it if they would uh, come up and speak uh, about their project and then um, be available to answer questions. So take it away. Good morning, Mayor Pro Tem, Good morning. members of the commission. Gwen Rowich, Deputy Public Works Director. Uh, the item before you today is a request for water for a 3,842 square foot medical facility. You can see on the map here on the screen that it's located off of Distinction Way and Assurance Way, which is just south of SR 89A and the Larry Caldwell exit. It's located in the Center Point West subdivision. And it's adjacent to the Tri-City Surgical Center, is that? It, it, yes, ma'am, it is. That's located right here at the top of the picture. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so under the uh, Water Management Policy 1, a site plan was submitted for review for this project to the Planning and Zoning Commission on July 14th. The Planning and Zoning Commission voted unanimously to recommend approval of the project. The applicant did submit a demand analysis for this facility, which will include five patient rooms, as well as five employees working year round. The potable demo, uh, water demand for this project was estimated at 0.13 acre feet per year. And let me just bring up the site plan here. So this is the site plan for the project. You can see there's a considerable amount of landscaping here in this area. Uh, the landscaping area was estimated at approximately 0.87 acres for the site, applying our factor of 1.5 acre feet of water per acre per year. The estimated demand for landscaping is 1.31 acre feet. For a total demand of 1.44 acre feet per year for this project. The staff did an analysis of the request and it does not exceed the 50% water remaining in the water budget. This is considered a non-residential project. The applicant is here in the audience today to answer your questions or I'm happy to take any questions you have at this time. Uh, that was pretty comprehensive. Does anyone have a question for Gwen? Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, invite the uh, applicant um, to come up. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Dr. John Furman. I'm a physician and I will be the owner and operator and practicing physician in this clinic. Uh, my intention with this clinic is to create a sanctuary I was trained to, as all other medical doctors are, to control symptoms and to um, what's euphemistically called disease management, which to me is throwing pills at people and preventing a premature death with little regard to how well they actually are and what they're experiencing in their daily lives. And I've, I've learned through my own observations, my own thinking, that in order to achieve healing and in order to achieve wellness, people need more than that. So this clinic is designed from the ground up to support that intention. 
one of the components of that is to create, as I said, a sanctuary where people feel that they can relax because relaxation is important to healing and people feel that they are in a place that supports their overall well-being. Nature is good at doing that. And if you look at this plan here, you'll see a walking path mm -hmm. that goes through the landscaped area. This is intentional. I like it when people move and use their bodies, get out in nature, and get a little sunshine. This is just one small example of the things that I have in mind in order to help people be well and, be, and to heal. That's why this project has this type of landscaping planned for it. Okay, Dr. Dr. Furman, I, ha I have a question. When I was looking at the uh, background, it, uh, the water's based on uh, 365 days a year. Are, are you planning on having any overnight or residential uh, services uh, at your clinic? No, this is a day clinic only. So it's a, a day clinic, okay. Um, so you're gonna have five staff and then you have exam rooms for five patients? I'll start out with me and one staff member. Uh -huh. I don't wanna take on too much at the beginning, but there are five exam rooms because I'm planning mm -hmm. on expanding, hopefully with one or two other practitioners and supporting staff. Okay. All righty, does anyone else have any questions? No, I just have a comment. Um, I really like seeing doctors develop places where people can take a holistic view of health rather than just throwing pills at it, so I appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I just uh, wanted to ask this question. I know Gwen probably gets this question frequently, so I'm sure it's probably easily addressed, but we are confirming, conforming to our plant palette for the landscaping here, yeah. The Councilman Montoya, it's required under the Land Development Code that they plant low water use plants. Mm -hmm. We have a planting list available on the ADWR website, which they'll be obligated to use when their permits come through for review. Mm -hmm. I just wanted you to confirm my impression, so I appreciate that, Gwen. Thanks. And I just want to thank you for coming to Prescott and uh, joining our wonderful community. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, do I hear a motion? Mayor Pro Tem, I move to recommend forwarding WSA 22-017 to council for approval. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion passes 3-0. Thank you. Thank you. Which one do you want? Okay, the map. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good morning, Ashley Couch, Public Works Director. I'm oh. here to present the... Excuse me, Ashley, I need to announce the oh, agenda okay. item. <laughs> but don't curb your enthusiasm. Okay, item 4B, water service application number WSA 22-018, submitted on behalf of property owner Loma Buena, LLC, by applicant Kimley Horn and Associates. And Associates, it's a 1.04 acre parcel located at 201 North Montezuma Street. And I think this is uh, commonly known as the um, Airstream project. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, thank you. Honorable Mayor Pro Tem Rusing and members of the Water Issues Subcommittee, Ashley Couch, Public Works Director, and I'm here to present the Airstream Village project. This is right next to Mile High Middle School, as you see on the site location map there. Um, the site plan was uh, per the 2022 water management policy, policy number one, site plan was submitted for review um, and consideration by the Planning and Zoning Commission on um, the, at the July 14th meeting. Uh, I did pass a three to two vote under the condition that floodplain issues be resolved um, prior to uh, the city council meeting, uh, which is currently scheduled for August 23rd of this year. Um, 
And the project can, let me switch to the, where is it? I can't see the mouse. There we go. Right, that one? Okay. Okay, this is this um, landscape plan. And so it, it shows 10 Airstream trailers as shown on the plan and landscaping. There's some lawn areas, a water feature. Um, we have trees, shrubs, other ground cover. Um, and uh, this area is a, a portion of it basically to the, this is Granite Creek over here. This is the floodplain boundary right here. There's some issues that came up at the Planning Zoning Commission that I want to just touch on very briefly. But remember that the purview of this committee is to allocate water, um, not necessarily get involved in floodplain issues, but there was some misunderstanding at planning and zoning. So I wanted to correct that misunderstanding so that people going into the city council meeting had a better understanding of it. But basically, um, at the Planning and Zoning Commission, it was, it was mentioned incorrectly that in the event of a flood that these would be relocated out of the floodplain. That is not accurate. Um, these trailers are going to be placed on drill shafts. They're going to be elevated to what's called the regulatory flood elevation. Mm -hmm. In Arizona, we have a foot of freeboard, and that requires that the lowest floor elevation, or in the case of a recreational vehicle or mobile home, the bottom of the frame, has to be at least one foot above the base flood elevation, which is the 100-year water surface elevation. Um, so these units are being placed on drilled shafts. They're being securely bolted and anchored to the drilled shafts and elevated so that the, they will be a foot above the 100-year water surface elevation. That is in compliance with the Arizona revised statutes as well as our floodplain management ordinance. So um, I just wanted to correct that and say that um, as contrary to what I wrote in the memo, they've since uh, made some adjustments to um, their plan and now they're in compliance by raising those units to the regulatory flood elevation as. Mayor Pro Tem, can I yes. ask a question? So I guess, uh, Ashley, if I, if I interrupt you for a second, is that the flood, so you're saying Contrary to the floodplain issue being resolved at the time, is this saying more or less that that floodplain issue is now resolved at this point with that? The engineers who's here, Andrew Baird from Kimley Horn Associates, has indicated to me that this next review cycle will show that these are adequately elevated to the regulatory flood elevation. And keep in mind that um, we will not approve the improvement plans until this issue is resolved. And so uh, he says that the next cycle will take care of this. The next review cycle will take care of this. So, okay, I appreciate that clarification. Yeah, and uh, no Councilman Shishka, thank you, Chairman. Ashley, the two that voted against this were they voting based on our conversation over the last few minutes? One person was primarily concerned about the floodplain issues. And one was concerned about that, plus the proximity to Mile High Middle School. The discussion went, as I understand it, that um, you know, this, these are for short-term rentals, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, people are coming here on vacation, and they've got some gathering spots. They have a fire pit. They've got a water feature. Mm -hmm. They have uh, some lawn areas, and there could be some partying going on. Um, right next to a middle school, and that was another concern that was brought up by uh, a member of the of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Mm -hmm. So it passed three to two, but those were the concerns expressed at BNZ Commission, yeah. as Thank I understand you. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that Thank was, you. That, that's I appreciate that. Okay, sure. And thanks for bringing that up, because it's very important that we uh, make comments about planning and zoning and include their recommendations in the conversation. Ashley, I have one question. Maybe it's better for the applicant. Is there going to be uh, any connectivity with our new Granite Creek corridor pathway that's going to be going in along the creek? I think that's a good question for the applicant. Okay. Well, we'll wait. We'll wait for the uh, okay. applicant. All right. So, um, so going on to uh, water allocation. Um, the 10 trailers have an estimated potable water demand of 0.81 acre feet per year. 
The landscaping is, is fairly extensive to provide a park-like setting. Um, they want to promote semi-private gatherings and um, the landscaping will require 1.78 acre feet per year and there's a water feature which has a water demand of 0 0.01 acre feet per year pretty un inconsequential the um, th so you add those up and the total potable um, estimated water demand is 2.60 acre feet per year mm -hmm. And um, this project uh, is less than, uh, when you add to other projects under consideration, it's less than the uh, allocation for non-residential projects of 25 acre feet per year. It's also less than the 50% rule. Um, so it does appear to be in conformance with our uh, water policy. And that concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have or if you'd like to speak with the applicant. Mr. Montoya. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have a question, uh, and this might be for the applicant, so if the applicant wants to come forward and answer it, I'm fine with that, but uh, is there gonna be someone on site permanently or, or managing it? And the reason I ask as it relates That's to water question. is if there's someone there on a regular basis, then presumably the water demand would be higher if that person was there on a regular basis. Hi. Hello. I'm Spencer Andrews, and this is my brother Austin Andrews. We're both part owners and the operators of the village. Uh, to answer your question, there won't be anyone permanently on site outside of the guests that will be staying there. So how will the management work then, I guess? It'll operate similar to short-term vacation rentals in that sense, uh, but we both live in town, so we'll be there okay. you know, mm -hmm. if anything comes up or needs to be help, uh, dealt with immediately. Like VRBO, is that... Yeah, what you're going to be using Airbnb, uh, we'll whatever using it Airbnb is. Airbnb as well as direct bookings, but it won't mm -hmm. be necessarily operated as a vacation rental. The idea is really to create, much like the name indicates, a village where it's a, a, an exclusive resort for guests to mm -hmm. engage with each other should they want to, but also have their own privacy and exclusivity. Hence, the units that are individualized mm -hmm. rather than you know shared walls. So. When I was at the Planning and Zoning Commission and this item came up, there was some talk about um, initially in some of the PAC meetings you had had that there was going to be an on-site like, restaurant or something of that nature, and then you guys kind of backed away from that. You know, I, And the only reason I ask in the context of this committee is because I know that that would obviously change your water demand somewhat. So is, is, this, is this pretty much a finalized plan of what you envision going forward? Yes. Yeah. There, there, at this point, there's no restaurant going in. It was going to go in that, that top corner there where that big lawn is. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that wasn't really feasible for what we were trying to accomplish with, you know, ballooning prices and inflation, everything sure, just kind sure. of got out of control. So we slimmed it down and we kept it to this. You know, with the plethora of restaurants downtown, we felt that it really wasn't necessary and we wanted to be able to promote that for, you know, engagement with the, with the city. Sure. Uh, and then I guess my other question is, um, and, and it's somewhat moot now because of what Ashley said about, so what was it that you changed, were, were they designed to be movable and then you guys changed away from that or has it always been that they were going to be mounted essentially? No, they were always going to be mounted. Okay. The, the intent was to create fixed structures uh, and given the, the, you know, flood zone, it was, it was a challenging uh, hurdle to overcome and we found that these trailers would accomplish that, but we were never intended to be moved. moved. Okay. So we wanted to create a fixed structure with these trailers. And I'm and glad to clarify, they're, they're actually Avion trailers, which is very similar to Airstreams. Airstream is just a much more recognizable term. Sure, sure. Uh, the reason I asked was one of the concerns I had was that in the event of a flood, if you had to move all those trailers at once, it seems like that would have been untenable. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, well, quite a challenge. So, you know, we, we yeah. really wanted to come up with a solution that would mitigate that and be able to safely exist as, you know, any flood events were to occur. Right. That, uh, Chair, that's, th those are all my questions for the moment. Okay. Mr. Shishka, comments? Uh, no, ma'am. Oh, well, darn, I'm surprised. <laughs> well, I, of course, have a few comments. Uh, first of all, I remember that location had this old abandoned rundown kind of a motor lodge from the 1920s or something for as long as I can remember. It's been an eyesore. And so I want to thank you for being so creative and having to deal with the, uh, the floodplain issues because I know that eliminated a lot of uses. Yeah. 
And I think it'll help revitalize that area because we're trying to revitalize uh, South Montezuma Absolutely. area and it'll bring some activity and bring some people there. And as far as uh, partying and the um, Granite uh, Prescott Mile High Middle School, my kids went there. Um, there's a bar that was grandfathered in <laughs> that backs right up against the uh, school football field. So I think the kids are probably well aware of uh, uh, alcohol-related uh, activities. And uh, my question is, do you anticipate having any connectivity with the Granite Creek Corridor? I don't know if you're aware of all of our efforts to put a trail in yep. and kind of use that as access. Yeah, so that has been discussion, um, you know, and I think, you know, Andrew might be able to help guide us on that. We were hoping to add some kind of connectivity to it. Mm -hmm. um, when we were having those discussions, it you know it, it came about that it was delayed significantly. So we kind of mm -hmm. put it on. It's going to start her. this fall, I think. Okay. okay. Is what we're going to do. Uh, Andrew Baird, Kimley Horn. I too went to Mile High Middle School, and oh, my yes. daughter's at uh, <laughs> orientation right now this morning uh, for seventh grade. Congratulations! So recently, yes. Um, so I too am aware of the bars that are in the area. I walk down that alleyway on my way home from school all the time, so I can speak directly to that. Um, in the immediate, the uh, the project, the Granite Creek project, is getting advertised actually this week. So you're mm -hmm. right, uh, Councilwoman Rusing. It'll start in the fall mm -hmm. and be completed in spring. Uh, as part of the no rise analysis, we really couldn't construct a direct connection into the creek from the frontage or the, mm. the west side. Uh, but we do have a connection right across Carlton Street to that ramp, and you can tie right into the okay. uh, into the trail from there. So it's right across okay. the street. Okay, so it's right across the street. Right. Okay, that's a perfect ADA connection yeah. that gets you right into the trail. Maybe some right. signage will be there eventually in the future to help right. direct the out of towners. And it's, and it's fairly open along the west side, uh -huh. so we know through kind of the corridor planning and even what's going on with the trail improvements, there could mm -hmm. potentially in the future be a connection. But mm -hmm. the creek needs to be studied further. We need to go back and actually look at the actual floodplain elevation through there, through FEMA. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that has to happen. But in the immediacy, we're meeting all the requirements, as Ashley indicated, of, of the floodway itself with this development, with mm -hmm. potential future connection or enhancements uh, yeah. as that project progresses. Yeah, and we do need to be aware of the, the floodplain there, because I remember many years ago standing at the bridge with the uh, principal of Mile High Middle School. I think it was Jay Collier. And the creek almost crested that bridge. It did crest the bridge. It I did remember crest the, the only bridge. ever rain yeah. day we got in town. <laughs> it had snow days, but that rain day. was impressive. I have a picture. I went to yeah. school there when it happened. I have a uh -huh. picture in front of that. So uh -huh. that was the most. Oh, so that was you out there. Thing. That was me out there. <laughs> <laughs> Staying far enough away. My, yeah. my family's yeah. in construction, so I knew to stay away from the waters. But yeah, yeah. I, I remember that day very well. Yeah. So. Um, Anyway, I, I think that I just would like to say also uh, with the 10 uh, Airstream units there, do you envision like maybe if there's a large wedding, um, maybe they would book all of them sort of? Yeah, so uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily define it like as groups? a large wedding, but yeah, certainly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> certainly <laughs> would be a buyout of the entire property uh -huh. so that, you know, other guests wouldn't be disturbed or anything, or mm -hmm. perhaps if there was a corporate retreat that they wanted yes. to set up, you know, we could use all 10 of those uh, trailers to be able to, you know, provide that experience for them. And that's what the lawns and, and the trails mm -hmm. throughout the, the gardens really mm -hmm. will enable people to do is have a community experience, but also mm -hmm. have their own privacy. So. Yeah. Well, I think that looks like a real creative, interesting uh, project that's going to be a wonderful asset. Um, I have had some uh, feedback from one person who thought, oh, no, a mobile home park right on the main drag. But you have to realize, historically, we have a lot of mo mobile home parks dotted throughout our community, especially in that area. For example, Lazy G, which is just around the corner, was a mobile home park. So I think it just fits right in with our Tradition. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you said that because our, our original intention was actually to restore that motor lodge. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, as you can imagine, the building was quite <laughs> uh, under yes. par. Yeah. Yes. So uh, we couldn't restore the building and mm -hmm. we really, you know, struggled to come up with an idea that mm -hmm. preserved that history, if you will. And we felt mm -hmm. that these 
units would actually capture that and as well as bring it into the modern century. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my other question is, um, for the little pads around each uh, unit, um, have you thought about maybe artificial turf rather than uh, green grass? We did. Um, you know, with the artificial turf, it, it just adds to um, the faux uh, mm -hmm. experience, which we were trying to stay away from. Uh -huh. um, in addition, we we're going to need mm -hmm. to irrigate it regardless to be able to clean the turf. Mm -hmm. And it just creates more of a mm -hmm. challenge to keep up with the, the cleanliness and, and ability to, you know, keep things sanitized and safe, yeah. frankly. Especially if you're pet friendly. Yes, yeah. and, and we uh -huh. will be. So that it was, was a discussion we had and we just felt the real grass was the best way to go. And, you know, frankly, mm -hmm. with the heat during, during the summers, it would help keep things a little bit cooler rather than mm -hmm. the turf, so. Yeah, and uh, especially I look at it as kind of working grass. It's gonna be used for events. Yeah and not just ornamental out along the street somewhere. Right, correct. Yeah. Okay, well, does anyone have some more comments? I just want to say my biggest concern was that floodplain issue, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're not going to be trying to move 10 trailers down uh, Montezuma <laughs> in the event of a 100-year flood. So, and, and I do think that um, I, I would just say that uh, I know there are other communities in, in Arizona who have done these kind of like Airstream-type villages. I know that's not the actual brand that you're using, right. but um, I think that... I, I've seen some of those, and I imagine people will be pleasantly surprised with what the actual, like, kind of caliber of that looks like in terms of it's not, um, you know, it's not like you're creating um, concerns around. It sounds like my experience with Airbnb and that kind of thing is that you're not, it, it's catering to a more higher end customer, exactly. so, so to speak. And I don't think that it's going to create this transient experience. You know, I, I ran an Airbnb for about three and a half years in Prescott. And in my experience was that most of the people are pretty respectful to their neighbors and they're seeking to have a little bit higher quality of experience than just staying in, you know, maybe a, a, a traditional hotel experience. And they want to be more integrated into the community. And so I think this is actually a really good concept. Um, I have other questions that aren't within the purview of the Water Issues Committee. So when you guys come um, before us on council, I'll probably have more extensive questions but uh -oh. from a, from a, no not 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 bad i'm just, no it's not i'm not i'm just saying you know i i'm trying to stay within the agendized uh components of this meeting but i think that uh it you know from a water perspective it seems like you guys have have done all your work so i'm i'm fairly pleased okay well thank you very much gentlemen thank you really thank you. appreciate it and uh do i hear a motion chairman uh, we have Leslie Hoy that would like to speak. Oh, oh, yes, thank you. You're Go ahead, Leslie. Leslie, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, I don't, I mean, this looks like an interesting project, but I have to ask some water questions. Um, recently, we've been allotting 1.5 acre feet per acre for the landscaping. So this goes a little bit over that. Um, so I I was wondering how the landscaping water use was calculated. I'm just gonna read these questions quickly because probably they can be answered in a bundle. Um, how it, the water use was calculated, whether the water use would decrease after the landscaping was established and then um, in response to the idea that um, um, artificial turf is a faux experience, I just have to say that lawn should be a faux experience in our area. Um, so I'm not too keen about the, you know, all the lawn. And maybe somebody could comment on how much the water use would be going to the lawn areas. That's it, I'll listen now. <laughs> Uh, Andrew Baird, Kimley Horn. I, I believe, I don't know if the demand analysis, the breakdown per plant and per shrub was included in the packet, but our landscape architect uh, put a detailed, uh, basically demand schedule together based on all the plant usages um, to come up with that number, including the turf. I can't mm -hmm. speak exactly what the split is between turf and planting, uh, but I know there's a detailed schedule that has it in there. And to the second question, Certainly, during an establishment period, there would be more water use uh, to establish the plants, mm -hmm. and over time, 
Um, uh, there may, may be less. This is a maximum mm -hmm. demand we'd see from, maybe, from landscape and irrigation. Maybe coming up with, maybe you can calculate how many square feet of lawn you're yeah. planning on having, and then we can come up with a, a number. It's, yeah, it's in there. We sent that as part of the application. I just didn't print it up and bring it with me today. Okay. So and it's if all I backed can, up by, by demand through landscape. If I can add, uh, just... You know, we have the tables, 1.5 acre feet per year per acre for traditional landscaping. Um, we also have demand analyses that the engineer submits, uh, you know, signed and sealed document saying that we anticipate this to be the water demand. For this particular project, the, the, the water demand analysis showed a higher water demand than based on the tables. Um, so that's what we went with. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and you got to realize this is an infill project in our older traditional neighborhood. So um, I think that uh, just having uh, decomposed granite and boulders everywhere probably wouldn't uh, be too attractive to the guests, I imagine. Yeah. But okay. I have to say that we have lots of really lovely zero scape. <laughs> um, <Yes. laughs> I don't. I don't want to imply that. Mm -hmm. low water use landscape is unattractive and I don't think it's you know I can see having some lawn area and actually the landscaping plan looks really exciting I'm just concerned that it went over a little bit over yeah. um, you know what we've been allowing for um, under the new water policy for landscaping mm -hmm. and maybe there's a place to cut out that 0.28 extra er acre feet Mm -hmm. I just feel like these questions need to be asked. Can, Chair, can I? Yes. Uh, so, Ashley, I, I just want to, to Leslie's question, I guess I, I, I want to clarify a little bit from my understanding. We have a table that we use to uh, attribute landscape use for a project like this, and then the engineer project, the, the landscape uh, in, architect basically came back and said, in spite of what your table says, we think our actual demand is going to be higher and so we went with what they what they provided is that am i getting that right that's accurate okay yes. councilman uh, i guess the reason i ask that is i i'm sensitive to what leslie's saying um in terms of you know i don't want to see someone come in with you know giant landscaping needs and and really suck up a lot of you know what is a really precious resource in our community mm -hmm. but i also think that it's to the benefit to kind of look at these projects and say we really appreciate when people can be more forthcoming about their actual now their actual demand analysis you know instead of saying oh no we'll we'll go by your table and then what happens in my experience is or what i've seen happen sometimes is that especially with non-residential projects potentially we run into an issue where as we move down the line we if we do a look back and we say oh well this mm -hmm. project was only going to use x amount of acre feet and then we find out they're using much more there's some frustration around that and so i i guess from from my perspective uh, I, i'm not you know i i wouldn't want to see every single commercial project that we approve come in like this necessarily but i do appreciate the candor of the applicant to to say you know this is what we're really going to use mm -hmm. so plus Plus, uh, Steve has something to say. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so, Ashley, we're not saying when we estimate use for an acre for landscaping, we're not saying that that's the max they can use for an acre of landscaping, are we? We're not. We, we look at a water demand analysis. We look at our tables and then use some judgment as to what we feel the right number is, and that's what we put in the... In the, in the memo to the water issues subcommittee and ultimately to city council. Mm -hmm. And so what they, pr what they presented was an estimate of the maximum use of their landscaping, right? Or no? Okay. Uh, Gwen Rowich, uh, I think I can shed a little light on this. So when most applicants are at this stage of their project. They don't have a landscaping plan. Mm -hmm. They're not that far along in the process. In fact, we heard that last month on one of the projects. We, well, that's one of the last things we do. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so for those applicants, we use the 1 in 1.5 acre feet per year per acre of area that they anticipate to landscape using our low water plant list. 
this applicant is much further along in the process. Mm -hmm. So their engineer was able to actually do a demand calculation based on the different planting types that they've already chosen, and they know what their water use will be. So we're not, their estimate is much closer than I believe you would know from someone who were applying the average 1.5 to one acre to. So I believe that's the difference that you're seeing. Once they start using water, that information will be fed mm -hmm. into the water resource management model, or the worm we call it, and our model will track their water use every year, year over year, and after five years, we know what their average water use actually is. So we're not saying to them, you can't use more than 1.78 acre feet. They're telling us, we believe our water use will actually be 1.78 acre feet, so that's what we wanna put into the worm. We wanna be as close as possible, so that when we get to the end of that five year rolling average, we're actually hitting pretty close or darn near on that target. So mm -hmm. we're not saying this is all the water you get. We're saying this is how much water we believe we are actually going to use so we can, uh, we can plan for that for other users who come and ask for water. Does that make sense? Yeah. Makes sense. It does, but I, that leads me to a follow-up question. Sure. <laughs> so, so, and I apologize, Gwen, but uh, so I, I'm just throwing out an idea here, so bear with me. Uh, so let's say that this the, the projected demand is 1.78 on uh, on landscaping for this particular project. What happens if four years down the line we see that they're actually using, say, you know, two and a half? Like, is there once they've been given the water, they've kind of been given the water, right? Under the current policy, Councilman, that is correct. What will happen is they're going to get a water bill. Yeah, the tiered, the tiered That's rate system should. Yeah. And the water bills are what drive conservation. Mm -hmm. I agree. Water bills have been had the biggest impact on conservation in this community since 2006. Mm -hmm. That's why today, almost 20 years later, we use nearly the same amount of water as we did 20 years ago uh, because I, I, rates compel people to use less. I, I completely Especially agree. Especially with I, the tiered rates now. That is I, I completely agree, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not pushing back. I just, I, I just kind of want to, uh, it's just it was a thought that occurred to me. And, and I, again, I, I, I sent an email to someone yesterday saying that exact statement about the biggest tool we have in our, in our quiver for water conservation is our tiered water rate system. So I'm 100% with you. I think it's, it's a big asset to the city. I just, I guess, what I hear you saying, what some of this discussion has kind of, what, what has crystallized for me a little bit is that uh, I am appreciative when applicants come before this water issue subcommittee and have kind of been this far along in the process and can give us a real honest look at what their water usage is gonna be. Because I think that informs us better and it gives us more clarity to our oversight role that we provide for council to kind of move things forward. So I, I would, I would, to a certain degree, commend the applicant for having done this work and, and bringing a, a, a more accurate uh, water analysis to us. Well, I will, I, a couple things. We, we fell, once the water policy was adopted, we were already partially through our permitting process, so it just kind of happened to be that we were this far, far along, so I would not want expectation on future projects to be that they would receive this sort of demand analysis. We just, by the nature of the project, the project had progressed to this point. Then we went back to P&Z to follow policy and actually had all our ducks in a row in terms of those mm -hmm. those calculations. So I did just want to clarify that. But um, And then I did pull up the table, and it is, it's 1.34 acre feet per year for turf. Um, and then uh, a little less than half, 0 0.11, 0 0.33 for tree, for vegetation. So that, and that table's included in the demand analysis. And the last thing I'll say, is there some advantage now to being in the flood wake? So we're gonna see more water than any other right. site. So we'll be able to actually reduce. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we might be flooding, we'll be irrigating our turf and our yeah, landscape. Yeah. And your trailer won't float away. Right. And, and to be perfectly honest, the lawn in the northwest uh, corner is actually a detention basin. So that automatically sees water right. after every storm. So right. that if it's smart watering, that will not need to be irrigated near as much. So it's, Fair enough. it's just certain things to keep in mind. Yeah. Plus there, um, there's several seed blends for uh, grasses that are, uh, you know, the Prescott, you know, specially designed for the Prescott area. Right. Low water use, a little hardier. And also, you know, at my house, I have um, incorporated a Xeriscape um, artificial turf in the shady areas, and I love it. It looks great. 
Okay, any more comments? Peter Krupnik. Go ahead, Peter. I have to unmute. There we go. I should be unmuted. You are. You are. Uh, 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 Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members, I just want to point out that I also serve on the Water Policy Review Committee from yes. the mayor as formed. And this applicant is on the cusp of what we're going to do with this new policy. Uh, unfortunately, maybe for him, but what we're trying to consider and we've been talking about is what we do if he, she exceeds the application. Uh, there currently, I don't believe in anything in there that will uh, let us penalize if he uses more water than we're allocating. And so I, I guess my, my question is, can we say anything, do anything to say that five years down the road, he's using more water, what's he gonna do? Is there any way to build that into this project at this early stage? Thank you. So I think I can somewhat address that. Uh, Mr. Krupnik used the word allocate. We're not allocating water, we're estimating water. Under the current policy, we estimate how much water so that it can go into the model. And then again, we take the five-year rolling average. Because there's no contracts like we used to do in the past, in the past, every request like this would enter into a contract with the city with a certain amount of water allocated to it. Some of those contracts even had penalty language if you exceeded the amount that was allocated to you or you would pay higher rates or penalty fees if you exceeded those numbers. But we no longer enter into contracts. We estimate water usage and we put it into the management model. So I think that's kind of the difference between what Mr. Krupnik is talking about how we used to do things and how we currently do things today. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, I think it'd be interesting to find, figure out how many um, square feet of actual grass we're uh, gonna be talking about. I think that'd help us with our, with our number. Okay, is everyone, any more uh, public comment? No more. Thank you, Peter, appreciate it, good point. Um, do I uh, hear a motion? Mayor Pro Tem, I move to recommend forwarding WSA 22-018 to council for approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 3-0 unanimously. Okay, moving on to item 4C, water service application number WSA 22-009, submitted by Exceptional Healthcare. Prescott, on behalf of property owner EHC Prescott LP, it's on a 9.2 acre parcel and it's located at 4822 East State Route 69 at the corner of State Route 69 and Robin Drive by Diamond Valley. Are the, um, is the applicant or a representative here today? Okay, thank you. Okay, go ahead, Gwen. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the commission, this application is for exceptional health. As you noted, it's located on Robin Drive, which literally is at the furthest reaches of the city. The city limits end here. This is Diamond Valley, kind of to the north, northeast, and this is State Route 69, so it's past Yavapai Hills, past the ranch as you're headed out of town. It um, has a traffic light on the corner too. It does. Yes. Let's see if I can bring up the site plan. So this, uh, this project per policy number one, the site plan went to the Planning and Zoning Commission on July the 14th. The commission voted unanimously to recommend approval of this project. I will say that the site plan here is showing the building that they're asking for water for now. And then it shows a future pad here. But today's project or today's request is only for the initial site. And the future pad is gonna be for medical offices. That's my understanding, but we'll ask the applicant yeah. when they get up here. Okay. <clears throat> so the applicant submitted a water demand analysis, which showed 22 employees and a 10 bed facility. 
resulting in an estimated water demand of 3.95 acre feet. The landscaping water demands include an additional 0.21 acre feet per year. Under the water management policy, this project does not exceed 50% of the remaining water budget. As I made a comment earlier, it went to the Planning Commission in July and is scheduled to go to full council at the end of August. I'd invite the applicant up. I'd invite the applicant up. <laughs> well, I have a question before for you. Um, sure. This is a unique uh, project. Um, looks like there's going to be a lot of excavation going on and terracing, terracing of the hill behind the, mm -hmm. the hospital. And um, is there going to be landscaping on that terracing? Is it going to be dripped or landscaped? We or? can ask the applicant that, but if they disturb, they must revegetate. Okay. Or stabilize, they can stabilize in other manners. Mm -hmm. But that's usually a part of the improvement plan review for the project at administrative level. Yeah, and then another unusual aspect of this project is that there's a storage tank for um, fire. It's a 40-foot high storage tank. Uh, do you know how many uh, cubic feet of water is going to be stored in there? How many gallons? Uh, the applicant comes. Oh, okay. Because yeah. uh, as I stated, they're at the furthest extents of the city water system. Okay. So if they can't achieve fire flow, mm -hmm. then they would have to install a tank of this nature on the site to meet fire requirements under the fire okay. code. Chair, I have a question that I think probably is more for Gwen than the applicant. So it, okay. if I might, just Go before ahead. the applicant comes up to answer some of your questions, Gwen, I, I was curious about if there was a breakdown because there's. It, the memo reads that there's a calculation, a combined calculation between the staff that'll be on site for the for the uh, medical facility, and also the inpatient usage of that facility. Is there a breakdown that you can tell us about? Like, because uh, it just you know the inpatient component seemed like the demand of that water might be something that'd be worth knowing about. So I didn't bring the d water demand. Uh, analysis with me but what I can tell you is that we have a table in our general engineering standards table 4-1 that has a list of uses and water demands for those particular types of uses so when the engineers calculation comes in we expect their numbers to Match. mirror that or exceed that based on their own knowledge of a similar type facility or something of that nature so I, I'm sorry I didn't bring it with no me. it's okay I just I guess it, um, it you know it, it, it occurs to me, you know, you have, you know, 10, what is it, 10 inpatient uh, on site? I mean, it's, it, may, it may be insignificant to, to, to the water man, but I just was curious. Typically, we receive a um, water usage within the facility, and then we receive a landscape, and then if there are other water features on the site, then we receive calculations for that as well. So they generally lump it all together, but they use that table for the various types of uses to come up with that demand. Gwen, wasn't there originally a plan for this site? A while back that was going to be like assisted living or a hotel. Oh, there have been so many yeah. that have come before and tried to develop this site. It's a difficult yeah. site to develop. Yeah. As you mentioned, the topography is a challenge. It's at the mm -hmm. end of the city water system, so mm -hmm. it's difficult to achieve fire flows for any kind of commercial uses. Mm -hmm. um, it's, the, the applicant has been very creative in um, mm -hmm. meeting those those needs of, for the site, so I applaud the applicant for that because this is a difficult site to develop. Mm -hmm. But there have been many, many that have come to, to our pre-application conference yeah. and tried to develop the site in a variety of ways. Yeah, I, I think it's an excellent location right there on the highway, but it's just uh, with the hill there and everything, it's going to require a lot of work. So any, any more questions for Gwen? Okay, may I invite the applicant up? Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Don Nicolini. I'm Development Director for Exceptional Healthcare. I have with me Larry Morris, our civil engineer. And out of due respect for our councilman, I'd like to remove my sport coat before. We <laughs> Roll up the sleeves. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think, in the interest of time, uh, you have questions. Let's go right to them. Um, 
Well, let's see, it's gonna be 10 beds, and I expect those 10 beds to be fully occupied and 22 uh, employees. And this is gonna be year round, uh, 24 seven, 365 that days a year. Um, do you have any plans? Uh, are you just gonna play it by ear for the future medical office complex? Today we are uh, designing that facility as a ambulatory surgical center. Oh, okay. We are in discussions with two local groups that I'm, mm -hmm. um, I can't disclose who they are. Yeah. It's down the road a piece. Okay. We need to get this facility up and running mm -hmm. and stabilized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, well, it seems uh, pretty straightforward, 4.16 uh, acre feet um, a year. Um, I don't know. Does anybody... Yeah, um, and then I assume that that includes an allowance for the uh, revegetation of the the hillside that's going to be attractively landscaped, similar to the Lowe's Hill. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with that one. <laughs> yes, Madam Chair. Um, our landscape architect is in the process of finalizing the design. It's going through the second review with your city's arborist. They talk mm -hmm. a language, I'm sorry, but I don't understand, but they're figuring it out. Okay. All righty. Um, any other comments or anything? It looks pretty straightforward, and you, you think you're going to be done by uh, the end of 2023 of next year? I certainly hope so. Oh, okay. I, uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the city for allowing us to receive an at-risk grading permit. Mm -hmm. As you pointed out, this is a difficult site to develop. Mm -hmm. Terracing is going to take us 90 to 120 days. We were granted the grading permit last Tuesday. Mm -hmm. The excavator will mobilize a week from today mm -hmm. and um, we'll be off and running. Okay, all righty. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, do I uh, hear a motion? Uh, Chair, I'll move to recommend forwarding WSA 22-013 for count to council for approval. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye passes unanimously to the city council for consideration. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Oh, I forgot to ask if there was any public there comment. There weren't any. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Thank you. Okay. Last but not least, moving on to item 4D, water service application number WSA 22-013. Submitted by applicant Paul Aslanian on behalf of property owner Craftsman Court Holdings, LLC. And it's a 10-acre parcel located out in Chino Valley on the corner of Juniper Drive and Alderwood Way. Okay, hit it. All right. So this, this is an interesting application. Mm -hmm. I can honestly say in my time here at the city, I have not brought one of this nature here before, so I'm going to try to walk you through the paces because it's a little bit different. So this is a 45-lot single-family residential subdivision known as Craftsman Court. It's in Chino Valley, and the city has uh, entered into an intergovernmental agreement with the Chino Valley Irrigation District in 1998 to convey water rights as part of the purchase of the lakes. So when that occurred, um, many land um, received water credits from the city as part of the city agreement to the tune of 0.25 acre feet they are allowed or per acre of land. So this parcel is just a little over 10 acres, so they are entitled to 10 connections or 10 dwelling units per the CVID agreement that they have with the city. But as I mentioned previously, it's a 45 lot single family subdivision, so the developer is 35 lots short. One of the, um, one of the policies in our water policy 
and I don't remember which one it is. Number 22, policy number 22, says that an applicant can purchase extinguishment credits. That's when a person that has the right to irrigate their land uh, from 1998 can extinguish their water rights for agricultural purposes and hold those water rights for a different use. But they no longer use the water to farm the land. So that's called an extinguishment credit. So many landowners in Chino Valley have extinguishment credits of this nature. So the applicant sought out owners that have extinguishment credits and purchased them in order to meet the remaining water demand for his project. Those extinguishment credits are purchased for 100 years. So for each extinguishment, or for each um, dwelling unit, he needed 0.17 times 100 times 35 lots, wow. which equals 595 extinguishment credits, which Mr. Oslanian purchased for this project. They also hired Herb Dishlip to do a water demand analysis for this project, and Mr. Dishlip estimated their water use to be 6.96 acre feet, which would include not only the dwelling units, but the landscape areas of the project. Mr. Aslanian has brought to you 702.12 acre feet of uh, extinguishment credits to meet this requirement. So he, he bought just a little bit more than he needed. He bought about 6.12 acre feet more than he actually needed. Those water uh, extinguishment credits will be pledged to the city and moved into the city account or the city's water portfolio. So Mr. Aslanian's request is not subject to the water budget because he has brought his own water rights to you. The water policy says that the city may accept extinguishment credits for a project should it so choose to do so. Um, <clears throat> I think that is the major components of my memorandum, but I'll answer questions, because I'm sure there are questions. Yes. Chair. Yes, Mr. Montoya. Thank you. Uh, so this is, I mean, Gwen, as you noted at the beginning, th this sounds like a fairly unique approach to to getting the uh, water rights in this situation. What is there? Why was this approach taken on? And maybe that's something the applicants speak, can speak to better than you can. We have had other applicants get fairly long along in this process before, but they've never gotten this far, primarily because the applicant must also get approval from the town of Chino Valley for their project. And in previous cases, they were seeking densities that the town was not fond of in those particular locations. I can tell you that uh, we met recently with the town manager and the, the mayor of Chino, and they recently adopted um, language into their code that says lots less than an acre must be on a municipal sewer system. This project will be tying into the town of Chino Valley sewer system. So while that will not bring recharge credits back to the city of Prescott, it will benefit the aquifer as a whole and the region as a whole. So our code does say that they must tie to city sewer. In this case, they're not able to tie to city sewer because it simply doesn't exist here. Um, but the fact that they can tie to town sewer is a huge benefit sure. to this project, much better than 45 septic tanks. Right, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah, and, and what I'd like to say is a lot of people don't know, but because of the Chino Valley Irrigation District uh, agreement, we have like a water district out there. It's like a water service area that we have that's part of yes. water that we provide. And um, and as far as the extinguishment credits, I mean, you just can't go out and buy extinguishment credits from like say, I don't know, Tucson or something. It has to be in our AMA. That is correct. Yeah, it's restricted to our here. AMA. You just can't buy them statewide. So, so it, kind of stays in our aquifer. It stays in our AMA. Yeah. Yes. Can I ask a question? Uh, how many uh, property owners were 
these extinguishment rights purchased from? Because it sounds like a lot, but maybe it's just one particular individual had a lot, or do, do you have an idea? This applicant purchased them from three s separate individuals. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and then what did the, the Chino Valley Town Council and their planning and zoning, did they have any comments that we should be aware of They this approved project? the preliminary plat, Mayor Pro Tem, mm -hmm. and until the applicant has a secured water supply, he cannot apply for a final plat with the town, okay. so this is his next step. Okay. Because I just want to comment on the plat that uh, it's a very nice uh, egress and ingress, and he actually has two <laughs> entrances, whereas we usually have one entrance for a 400-unit uh, subdivision. <laughs> We're not flat. We're not flat. It's pretty flat here. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, uh, I would just like to comment that um, I'm just not happy to hear that this is exempt from our water budget, that it's partially part of an existing contract, partially extinguishment credits, which is okay, but I think for bookkeeping uh, reasons and for our budget, um, do you think that it might be worth uh, asking the uh, committee, the Water Policy Oversight Committee, to kind of look at this and see if there's anything that we can do? Because I have a feeling we're going to get more projects like this in the future from out there where we can include this in our water budget numbers. So I, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I think it would be disingenuous to put it into the budget because the city is not giving the applicant water from well, our I mean, not portfolio. this project. I mean, this because we don't, haven't done it yet, but maybe for future projects. It's something we can discuss. Okay. Uh, we could have conversations about it and what the mm -hmm. benefits and the pros and cons might be of that. But I don't believe it, uh, because we're not giving them water from the city portfolio, they're actually bringing water into the city mm -hmm. portfolio don't know that the budget is applicable in this sort of uh, yeah. scenario. Well, but we can discuss it. They're, they're still getting wet water, real water. There's always a debate, it, extinguishment credits, paper water, but in reality, you don't drink paper water. You have to have the actual water pumped out of, out of the well. And so, but uh, maybe that's something that we can explore and see if we can get it on the agenda, at least to have a discussion mm -hmm. to see if maybe it can be included in the future, these kind of uh, allocations. Um, any other uh, comments from Mr. Shishka? No, ma'am, my questions have already been addressed by the other two council members here. Mr. Montoya, any public no, comments? The applicant. And the applicant. Good morning, Mayor Pro Temp and Council Members. Uh, glad to be here, and thank you for, for hearing you? this. My name is Paul Oslanian. I'm yeah, the I developer, so. and um, <laughs> I just wanted to add something, Gwen, that um, that re you referred to on your previous uh, one of your previous uh, reviews. We have uh, a two and a half acre park in this case, but we are going very low water usage. There's only five percent, less, little less than five percent in turf. Um, in that uh, two and a half acres, about 5,000 mm -hmm. square foot of turf, right around the picnic area, and the rest of it's oh. just a walking trail, and we will border the property with, um, uh, with trees. So we're using about an acre foot uh, outside of the house uses on the whole 10 acres. Yeah, and how many square feet are the houses going to be? These, this project it was conceived to be an, uh, semi-affordable as much as we mm -hmm. could, although prices have gone up quite a bit in the marketplace, but the homes will be 12 to 1,500 mm -hmm. square foot, smaller craftsman-style homes. We built, built a few of them uh, so far, and they were well-received. We, uh, we got them done and put them all on the market for under 300000 and we had 21 offers uh, a couple months ago when we yeah. did this. So it, it'll hit a price point that will be much more affordable for people. Well, thank you for bringing that up because we know, uh, especially out in Chino, that there is a housing shortage and it does have the opportunity to be more affordable and that it does sound like it will help out the uh, workforce Absolutely. Uh, housing population. 
That's yes. that's our intention. Is we could build a bigger house, but mm -hmm. and as you know, with how that happens, a lot of times good intentions they start and regulations come, and then people mm -hmm. throw it to the wind. But we're staying with our our original plan to stay with a smaller, affordable home. So is is each home going to be separately metered? Yes, yes, each home will be separately metered. They are single family detached. They each have their own mm -hmm. lot with their own backyard and mm -hmm. such. And it uh, sounds like the park's a, a good a area. Are you going to have, like, playground equipment? There'll be some playground equipment, a little friendly. pavilion, and then there'll be a lot of open space. It's also drainage detention in that area, so um, that is just a, a little swell out there. And then mm -hmm. we... Um, there was a question about the city of Prescott, why we came to the city of Prescott with the water. Uh, we had both city of Prescott and Chino Valley available, and we also had sewer there mm -hmm. from, from Chino, but it just made sense to, to tie with city of Prescott water, and Chino's in agreement with that. So, mm -hmm. All righty, any, any questions? Okay, all righty, thank you very thank you. much. It sounds like a, a project that's uh, going to be very beneficial to the community of uh, Chino Valley. So do I hear a motion? Mayor Pro Tem, I move to recommend forwarding WSA 22-013 to council for approval. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay, motion passes 3-0. Okay, thank you everybody. And now we're moving on to item five, our discussion and action items. Um, A, approval of the July 5th, 2022 meeting minutes. Do I? Mayor, I move approval. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, I move approval. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. And then moving on to item 5B, 2022 water management policy discussion. Residential and non-residential water budget overview for January 1, 2022 through June 30th, 2022. And before you get started, I have a question. We didn't pass our new water budget till April 26th of this year. So is this discussion kind of retroactive all the way to the beginning of the year or... Where, does, where do we begin? Yes, this is Katie Hine, um, Public Works. So we are retroactive back to January 1st okay. of 2022. Okay, all righty. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I've been um, asked to present the final budget numbers for the January 1st through June 30th of 2022. Uh, water policy 11 through 13 established a semi-annual water budget for both residential and non-residential projects. Um, 25 acre feet per year was set for residential, and then another 25 acre feet per year was set for non-residential projects. So in total, we had 13 resi residential projects approved, totaling 13.66 acre feet per year. Of those projects, two were approved at City Council as they exceeded the um, administratively approved amounts. And then we also um, had 22 non-residential projects approving, uh, totaling 16.56 acre feet per year. Let's see. So on our city website, we do post the total projects that have been approved um, for residential and non-residential, including the total amounts approved and the amount remaining in the budget cycle as well. Um, we did not have any uh, non-residential projects approved at City Council. Um, the budget amount, uh, or the, the administratively approved amount did change with the new policy. Prior to the policy change, it was um, two acre foot per year. So a lot of our projects were approved prior to the, to the policy change um, at those, some of those higher numbers. Um, after the policy change, we did not have any commercial projects or non-residential projects approved over the two acre foot. Or, sorry, over the one acre foot. Um, <clears throat> in addition to the uh, fully approved projects, we also had 58 projects that were approved under existing contracts. Of that, there were three subdivisions, one multifamily complex, and 54 single family homes. Um, those are primarily in areas of ground, existing groundwater subdivisions um, or other contracts, uh, such as Grand Dells Estates, Depot Ranch, um, those kind of areas. That's the end of my presentation. If you have Chair, I, I have a question. 
Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, you, you mentioned that the administrative approval level for non-residential, um, essentially it, it went down. Is this retroactive look back, look at items that were below that threshold as well? So prior to the policy change, um, projects were approved under the two acre foot. Um, we'd not go retroactive back to reevaluate those projects, but they were accounted for in the budget cycle. So they were accounted. Okay, that's, yeah. that, that was more or less my question. The reason I ask is when we were passing the new water policy uh, at council, there was a lot of discussion around the idea whether these limits would get pushed past or, or kind of if they were, if they were too for lack of a better way to put it, stingy in terms of the, the allow, allowance. Um, looking at this data set, it kind of looks like that, at least for this first cycle, that wasn't the case. And I guess my question is, uh, I know we're posting updates on it as we go forward, and I think we don't always, you know, projects are in different stages and, and there's different seasons of development, I'm sure. Um, how do we stand right now with the, you know, I haven't had the opportunity to look at the current budgeting right now for where we stand. Currently right now we do have um, two non-residential projects have been approved and one residential project was approved at council um, last week. Okay. I actually have it. Perfect. Gwen has the numbers. If I can get it to entirely show up. Mm -hmm. I thought you might ask this question. Yeah. Okay. Got a reputation over there. I guess so. I anticipate what you might ask. That? Of one more click, my eyes aren't as young as Councilman mm -hmm. Sishka's. <laughs> How's that? That's perfect. Thank you. So that's where we're that's where we're at right now. So we had the one um, 82 dwelling unit go through City Council. Um, was it last week? Week before? That was the Cortez Apartments. Correct. Um, so that's where the budget is currently for residential projects. And then the non-residential projects, um, we did have two um, under one acre foot projects ap administratively approved, and then the three that um, went before you today. So I guess my question, and this might be a question more for Gwen or Ashley, but do you think, uh, what is your assessment of, of how the, uh, from what is staff perspe perception on, on is, is the water budget allocation that we have right now, is it, adequate? Is it, are, we, are there concerns about maybe things that are in the PAC process down the road that we should be aware of? So Councilman Montoya, I think that's a, a really good question. And from budget, water budget period to water budget period, I think that answer can, will change sure. based on what's coming into the queue. Given that it's only July, mm -hmm. um, and August, I, I'm actually. sorry, it's August second. Sorry, it's <laughs> August. we're over the hump. <laughs> we're into August. Um, given that we're only a month into a six-month cycle, uh, there is some concern for this budget period that we may fall short. But we do have provisions in the policy to address that. Mm -hmm. One of them is that if someone exceeds 50% of what's remaining, they can appeal to you. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, the other is that they have the option to wait, they, to hold their application until the next budget uh, cycle begins. And they, we will put them in the order accordingly to their, um, the, uh, uh, when they applied for the water. So as we come to you in, early December to talk about the next budget cycle, we will tell you who's waiting in the wings. Sure. So that we can take that into consideration when we set a number for the next budget period. The, the other question I would ask, and I know this, uh, you know, I know the mayor has the ad hoc committee that is looking at the water policy. I think it would be useful for them to have this item show up on an agenda for them as well, just because I think, you know, I would, you know, there's a, there's three of us here, here who are on council, but I know there's some different folks on there that are, you know, citizens of the community at large who have different kind of interests or, you know, uh, there are different stakeholders and different components. So it'd be interesting to get their perspective on it. And I think that's, my impression is that's really the crux of what that, that working ad hoc group is supposed to be tackling anyways. I would agree. I think that's the focus of that group. 
Yeah, so I, I would I very much encourage Public Works to to work with that um, ad hoc committee to to look at these numbers and and to have a, a really candid discussion about you know it, it sounds like if I'm hearing you correctly, Gwen, it sounds like there is some concern about where we stand. I think when I look at this table, I see that you know that Cortez apartment uh, you know improvement. Uh, chewed up a lot of, of a lot of the, the water that we have to allocate for this period. But the thing I think we have to keep in mind was that part of the reason at least I voted in favor of that that item was because I knew that it was going to be significant, you know, improvement to what is more or less low cost, you know, an affordable living in infill. Yeah. So I, I, I guess, you know, you, you kinda have to weigh those things, right? A little bit. That's right. So um you know, I, but I think it's, I guess I would just ask that the Public Works Department uh, continue having this dialogue with this committee uh, as we kind of navigate this new policy. And if adjustments need to be made, this is, you know, when I talked to different stakeholders in the community about this who were somewhat critical of the new water policy, I said, you know, one of the things that I thought was really great about this policy is that, you know, we as a council created it in a way that allowed for oversight and modification. And so I think, you know, if it, knows, if, it if it is the recommendation of staff that, you know, man, we're really getting a backlog here of, of applicants and it's, you know, stymieing, you know, meaningful development in our community, then then we need to look at that. So yeah. th those are all my comments, Chair. Would, would it be the, the committee's desire to see something of this nature on a monthly basis on your agenda? Yeah, if you could, um, if it's not a, a huge burden to come up with the uh, numbers, that'd be great. We we keep this running total on a daily basis. Okay. So yeah. we, we have I, it, and we post it on our website, too, for anyone that wants to see it. We update it on the first and the third Wednesday of every month, just so the public can also see. It's a very similar uh, spreadsheet to this one. We just don't track the, the actual budget. We track how much they asked for. Mm -hmm. Chair, Chair, if I could, I, I, I'd say that for, from my perspective uh, on this committee, I would it would nice to it would be useful to see the ebb and flow of this process as we move through, even if it's just a simple item of hey we want to you know if you include it in staff update you know hey here's here's the latest you know spreadsheet because I think that will give us on a month to month basis kind of what the flow looks like and that for me I don't know about the two of you but I, I would find value in that. Yeah. Since this is new, I thought that might be something you yeah. would like to see for a while. We yeah. could put it on general announcements on a monthly basis. Yeah. Gwen, I have, I have a question on this uh, chart here. Is Cactus Ranch on here, the uh, Government Canyon uh, mobile home uh, I believe park? It is. Uh, which one is it that? It should be on the residential list. Yes. Uh, number of units. Uh, I just see a bunch of ones. I think it's 12. Right right here, Mayor Pro Tem. It's item 12, item 12. on residential projects. The project number is ANX 21-004. Okay. All righty. Thank you. As you know, that's a very unique special project. Yes. And council did approve that one. Yes. Over the okay. All righty. Uh, any public comment? No. All righty. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much for the uh, update. And now we have um, general announcements from the staff. So Jennifer Leslie should be on the Zoom. She is, I see her. I'll bring up her item there. Good morning, subcommittee. This is Leslie Grazer coming to you by Zoom. Good morning, Leslie. Good morning, Good morning everyone. Um, I believe Gwen's working to put up a a document? Yep, I think you're good. Okay, thanks. So I was just asked to provide an update on your um, memberships, and those include Northern Arizona Municipal Water Users Association and the Upper Verde River Watershed Protection Coalition. Um, as you can see on the bullet points, we'll just uh, walk through those. Um, at their last meeting, each one had a board meeting. So the NAMWA group, uh, had their board meeting on July 15th of 2022. Uh, this is the time when they elect new board members. Um, being that had just recently happened because of changes um, related to some of our elected officials and other uh, communities as well, uh, they decided to stay with their board as it was, so there's been no changes there. The group did enter into a contract with High Country Conference Center and Flagstaff. And this is for an upcoming uh, water utility leadership forum that the group uh, made available two years ago, and they'd like to continue to do that. 
So the intent is to um, basically have your water resource managers uh, working with others in Northern Arizona and across the state to discuss timely issues um, and provide them a forum uh, to do so. It also uh, includes a, an operator's tract. So um, our city operators here, um, as well as others, can come and uh, earn their uh, professional development units, basically, um, to continue their certification statuses um, that they may have. So that's going to be May 19th, 2023 is the date that's set. Um, of course, there's a hotel reservation block, but I don't know if that's so important. Um, the, item that came in from the Arizona State Legislature, of course, was Senate Bill 1740, and this is uh, titled the Water Infrastructure Authority for Financing and Augmentation. This is uh, expanded WIFA um, authorities, basically. So there's monies involved. Um, the long-term water augmentation fund was 1 billion over three years. The water supply development revolving fund, 200 million. Uh, water conservation grant fund, 200 million and existing federal programs under the Safe uh, Drinking Water Act also remain have to have funding. So everybody's trying to get themselves uh, coordinated, situated with this new um, uh, legislation, legislation. And so we had a presentation provided to our board members um, and those attending as general public as well. Uh, last, the dues were paid by the city in the amount of $5,009.55. Uh, um, so we're up to date with that group. I don't know if there's any questions on NAMA or if you'd like me to proceed. Uh, go ahead. Okay, and your next group is your uh, Upper Verde River Watershed Protection Coalition. They met on the 27th of July. Um, this time I gave the presentation on uh, Senate Bill 1740, um, and that's available um, for everyone who's there as well as um, we've shared that. So if you're interested, you can have that. Uh, the Nature Conservancy Stormwater Management Funding Grant, uh, that uh, will be on the Town of Prescott Valley's uh, agenda on August 23rd. So as you know, this group is grant-driven uh, on the ground projects. So uh, in a partnership with the Nature Conservancy, it's the Pullman Grant um, that was uh, received, but it needs to be approved through the town because they're the fiduciary for this group. Um, the next one is the town of Prescott Valley has a, um, a complaint that they filed against a consulting firm that was acting on one of the grants. So um, that complaint has been filed and uh, we're awaiting what the outcome might be. So the basics of that was um, somebody was contracted to do certain work and they failed to perform. So um, monies were exchanged, but the work wasn't completed to the satisfaction uh, nor complete. So we'll have to uh, watch that one and see where that goes uh, with Prescott Valley leading the charge as they are the fiduciary and the one who filed the complaint because they were the contract signer. Um, the next one was Yavapai County um, has not been able to uh, reinstate a TAC member yet. So being this is such a small group, we need uh, all hands on deck. So um, we're waiting to see that, um, what the county decides. Uh, Mr. Montoya has a comment, Leslie. Leslie, is there any indication from the county that they're going to uh, fill that position or is there, um, it, you know, uh, it, it, has there been any insight from the county's perspective on that? At the uh, last meeting, um, the intent was to have a couple meetings before the board meeting to see if that could be resolved, and those were, had to be canceled. So they're working with um, the director over there for their floodplain to see if uh, that's where the technical support will come from again, or if it'll be another department potentially. Um, I know that Melody Reifschneider, who is one of the consultants for this group, uh, has been trying to keep active contact and reschedule that meeting. So as you know, the board member is Supervisor Brown, and uh, he was not present at this last meeting. He had a, an alternate. So that's the status. We're working on it. Okay. I appreciate that clarity. Uh, I, I just, um, I guess I'll, I'll add that for this to be an effective coalition, um, we need participants from the various members of the IGA. And so um, I, I just 
that that's just a comment, not necessarily a question for you. Thank you. Um, and then your last bullet item for this group is the grants. And so I think you're pretty well versed in these. The first one uh, through the Department of Water Resources, we understood that all sites are complete and operating. The next one, the USDA NRCS uh, grant agreement. This is the one that's been really challenging. It's uh, a large dollar volume or dollar amount. And uh, the paperwork is voluminous, um, it appears. So they think they'll be actually ready to go out to bid for that at the first of the year. So have all the pieces in place, put together the working group, and then uh, seek the bids they need to get the work done on the ground. And the last one they're looking at is the Water Protection Fund. So this is a fairly well-known grant. Um, they will be looking at this grant as well. And how the group needs to be looking is basically a year out. You just can't pull a grant in a week together. Um, you need to have some planning. So they're looking out uh, for this Water Protection Fund one you know, into the next year. Um, but the grant is available um, for folks to apply at this time. And that's all I have on these two uh, groups. Um, Thank you. Mr. Shishka has a comment. Yes, Leslie, do you have an update on the comprehensive agreement number one? Um, I think we can probably provide that during general announcements. Um, because <laughs> I guess it's it's broad yes. enough, or is that not true? I I, I agree. Like in a leadership room. role, decide if uh, we need to have that agendized. Okay. Chris is here. Chris is saying yes from the legal department. So I think you've got the go ahead. Yeah. Yes. To, it's okay. It's yeah. general mm -hmm. enough yeah. on the general announcements. Okay. Thank you, Chris. So the status of the contract, uh, Councilman Shishka, is that we have extended it through the end of August to allow for the discussions that we, I think this is what you're remembering, is that we were uh, going into a discussion period with them of all the technical folks to uh, make sure that we ended up with a model that was fully functional and that met the targets that we could see with actual data points. So um, they're working on that now. So our next milestone is uh, what we'll have in hand by August 30th from Golden. Okay, and you feel that's a reasonable date, Leslie? Um, <laughs> it's the first one that we've offered, so we didn't want to put it out three months. We made it a pretty tight timeline, so tight timelines can not always work. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to see uh, what Golder comes back with. Um, I think that we're all so strong-headed um, <laughs> that we require a good product. And it's not saying that they haven't worked to provide a good product. It's that these are um, intricate. It's it's not an easy build. It's not an easy, um, it, it's just not easy. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, appreci I appreciate you being we're strong. We're in our heels and we're not going to have the city come out with a product that we can't run and help make those future decisions that the city and the other stakeholders need. Okay. Well, well, like I said, thank you for being strong-headed. Mm -hmm. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Any uh, more comments? No. Okay. Any public? There are none. Comments? Okay. Well, I guess this meeting's adjourned. Thank you.